Namaste. So today we're going to look into the essence of the middle path. Now this is a very subtle subject and I expect that most of you won't get it. <laughs> but it has to be brought out because it's really the essence of the Buddha's teaching. And so what I'm going to do is read a riddle verse. A riddle verse, the, the Buddha sometimes would just drop these things on the monks, you know. <laughs> like the story behind this one is that they were talking about some stuff. Metta, I think. And then the Buddha just gives this verse and then retires into his hut, <laughs> goes into seclusion. Nobody can disturb him. So the monks are left scratching their heads. Well, what was that? <laughs> so the monks talked amongst themselves and they came up with six possible solutions for the meaning of the verse. Then later on when the Buddha came out, they uh, put these to him and said, which one is correct? And he said, they're all correct. <laughs> so I'm going to take one of the six that I think is a really good example for understanding the middle way, the middle path, and then show how it applies to dependent arising. So here's the verse. Yo ubhante viditvana madje manta nalipati tang brumi mahapuri soti soda sibbani matchaga. And the translation He who, having understood both ends with wisdom, does not get attached at the middle, I call him a great man. He has gone beyond the seamstress. So the monks formulated four questions. What is the first end? What is the second end? What is the middle? And who is the seamstress? And here's the solution I want to share with you. One end is pleasant feeling. The second end is unpleasant or painful feeling, and the middle is neither unpleasant nor pleasant feeling. Craving is the seamstress. Now, if this seems obscure and esoteric, it is. <laughs> That's why it's a riddle verse. So we have to figure out, well, what does this have to do with anything? And how can we implement it to help us understand dependent arising? Well, let's take an example. Here's a pencil. This will be our stick. Huh? So, one end is pleasant feeling. The other end, I guess the one with the eraser, <laughs> is unpleasant feeling. And in the middle, there's neither pleasant nor unpleasant feeling. These are the three kinds of feeling, according to the Buddha's system. Pleasant, unpleasant, and neither pleasant nor unpleasant. And then craving is the seamstress. Because if you recall, in the system of dependent arising, that uh, ignorance gives rise to sankara, sankara gives rise to consciousness, consciousness gives rise to name and form, name and form gives rise to the six sense spheres, and the six senses give rise to contact. Then when contact occurs, there's feeling, either pleasant, unpleasant, or neither, neutral feeling. Then after feeling, there's craving. Why? Because whether we have a pleasant feeling or an unpleasant feeling, now we have a feeling about this thing, whatever it is. 
that if it's pleasant, I crave it again. And if it's unpleasant, I crave it not to happen again. And so we are caught, as the saying goes, on the horns of a dilemma. A dilemma means two mutually exclusive alternatives, either pleasant feeling or unpleasant feeling. But most of the time, what happens is we ignore the third possibility. We ignore the middle way. We go to extremes, either unpleasant or pleasant feeling. Isn't it? See, the mind tends towards extremes by its nature. So when we encounter something, when our senses contact something, we tend to put it in one of two buckets, pleasant or unpleasant. And let's say we encounter something unknown. Well, usually what happens is that we assume it's unpleasant. Huh? Eat your vegetable, Johnny. <laughs> Ew, I don't like broccoli sprouts or whatever they are. <laughs> Brussels sprouts. Well, you've never had Brussels sprouts, Johnny. No, but I don't like it. <laughs> Isn't it? So we tend to assume that new unknown things are unpleasant. This is a, a general psychological tendency of the human race. The new is always suspect. We are skeptical towards it. We don't know. And so we automatically assume, well, it's probably going to be nasty. <laughs> so the problem is the seamstress. The seamstress is craving. And craving is the thing that's common to both ends, isn't it? Whether we crave to have a pleasant feeling again, or we crave not to have an unpleasant feeling again, in both alternatives, craving is a common denominator. So how do we interrupt the flow of cause and effect and stop the dependent arising and its consequences which lead to suffering? we take the middle path. Because if a feeling is neither pleasant nor unpleasant, how can we crave it again? See? It's just like love and anger. If we like somebody, if they give us pleasure, we say, oh, I love you. If they give us displeasure, we say, oh, I hate you. Isn't it? <laughs> But we don't think about the middle path. I neither love nor hate you. <laughs> you are the way you are. That's the way you are, so okay. See, this is the path to liberation. The middle way. Not going to either extreme. Not saying, as the Buddha uses in his, his famous example, uh, that... Everything exists is one extreme. Nothing exists is the other extreme. But we follow the path in the middle. Because of ignorance, sankara come to be. Because of sankara, consciousness. Because of consciousness, name and form. And so on. And with the removal of ignorance, then sankara cease. With the cessation of sankara, consciousness ceases, and so on and so forth. So you see, the, the Buddha's middle way allows both extremes to exist. But it actually follows the middle, not being committed to either extreme. Now, this is a new way of thinking for most of us. Most of us are so uh, conditioned to classify things as either pleasant or unpleasant, good or bad, right or wrong, yeah? cool or not cool, <laughs> depending on what we're, whatever we're using to measure it. That every time we have a new experience, 
it automatically gets dumped in one of these buckets. Well, we don't have to do that. Striking new idea. We can be detached. We can say, well, it's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Most of the time we judge whether something is pleasant or unpleasant by how our body feels about it. If it's nice, uh, if it feels good, then it's pleasant. If it doesn't feel good, it's unpleasant. Or the mind. If it satisfies our mind, we, th we say it's pleasant. And if it disagrees with our mind, we say it's unpleasant. But you see, here, all the time we're ignoring the third option. It's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. It's neither good nor bad. But you see, this is how we approach and attain Nibbana. It's very interesting. After hearing these solutions, the Buddha replied, In so far, friends, does a monk understand by higher knowledge what is to be understood by higher knowledge? Comprehend by full understanding what is to be comprehended by full understanding. Understanding by higher knowledge what is to be understood by higher knowledge. Comprehending by full understanding what is to be comprehended by full understanding. He becomes an ender of suffering in this very life. What does that mean? He attains liberation. He attains arhan. He attains moksha, nibbana, the ender of suffering. If someone can just understand that these things do not have to be judged good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant, right or wrong, huh? but we can take a middle path and not be judgmental, not be attached either way. That leads to the complete detachment from conditions, which means liberation from samsara, from dependent arising, the whirlpool, the vortex uh, that we talked about in the beginning, and attainment of nibbana. So just this one thought or a concept, this one principle, if you apply it, if it's just theory, it's not going to really help anything. But if you actually apply it in your life, oh, it's so powerful. It can lead to the highest. So I just want to read you a little something that uh, Jnanananda wrote about this. There's one sutra in the Nidana Samyukta, where Venerable Molia Paguna asks the Buddha, Who is it, Venerable Sir, that touches? Now remember last time we were talking about who is it that experiences birth and death and for whom is that birth and death? The Buddha said, not a valid question, because you're trying to make birth and death one thing and who experiences it another thing. And this does not lead to the holy life. So here also the Buddha says, not kalo panho, not a proper question. The Buddha says, I do not say that one touches. And he instructs Venerable Paguna to understand the occurrence of touch as a dependently arisen phenomenon, contact. Huh? Touch is contact. Seeing is contact. Smelling, tasting, thinking about. These are all instances of contact with the different senses. But who is contacting? Well, <laughs> there is no self. There is no I. I, the idea of self, is also a dependently arisen phenomenon. So it doesn't truly exist in its own right. It's only a thought. So there is no I who touches. There is no self who contacts. 
Therefore, this idea of pleasant and unpleasant feeling is simply an illusion created by the mind to justify the existence of I. If the mind can say or can create the conceit, my pleasant feeling, my unpleasant feeling. See, what's pleasant for you may be unpleasant for me and vice versa. But in, in either case, we're saying this is my pleasant or unpleasant feeling. And so if I can, if there can be my feelings, then of course there must be an I, right? <laughs> so the mind actually creates the feeling of I through inference based on labeling things as mine. This is deeply discussed in our videos on the Mula Pariyaya Sutta. Mula Pariyaya Sutta discusses this exact point. If you get that, and I'm going to put a, a card here to reference that video, if you actually can understand and, and see that in your own mind, that opens the door to complete enlightenment. Buddha Saranai.